Amen. Mark chapter 12 is where we left off. We're looking at the last few days of the life of Christ on earth before He is crucified. How He has gone into uh, Jerusalem and uh, welcomed with open arms. But by the end of the same week, He is going to be killed by the, some of the same crowd that were uh, welcoming Him. And um, in chapter 12, verses 1 through 12, Jesus gives a parable, the uh, parable of the wicked vine dressers, and we addressed this a uh, couple of weeks ago, but just for a, a refresh, re, to remind us, refresh our minds, it's talking about the nation of uh, Israel, the nation he is in. He said, I'm in verse uh, 1. Mark 12 and verse 1, A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers, and they went into a far country. A man there in verse 1 is referring to in the parable imagery, that would be God. He planted a vineyard. That would be the nation of Israel. You find that imagery uh, throughout the Old Testament, how God chose the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, planted them in the promised land and gave them uh, a land uh, flowing with milk and honey and blessed them. And um, verse 2, Now at vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. This is the concept of the, the purpose of Planting a vineyard is to get produce. Uh, Ezekiel 15 talks about that. You don't plant a vineyard to get the wood. You don't plant the vineyard just for the vine to grow. It's to make uh, grapes, clusters of grapes. So the purpose of Israel was to bear fruit unto God. In other words, glorify God, do His will, keep His commandments... And that is uh, something that would please uh, the owner of the vineyard, God. Well, it says in verse 3, They took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. This is talking about how they mistreated the prophets. Again, he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, sent him away shamefully treated. Again, mistreating the prophets. Again, he sent another servant, And him they killed, and many others beating some and killing some. Uh, This is talking about the prophets that were sent and how they were mistreated uh, by Israel. Uh, In prison, beaten, uh, shamefully treated. You read about that a lot in the book of Jeremiah, with Jeremiah and what he went through. And therefore, still having one son, verse 6, his beloved, he also sent him to them at last, saying, They will respect my son. Now, who would that son be in this imagery? Jesus. The owner of the vineyard, God, the owner of Israel, says, I'm going to send my son. But the vine dresser said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And verse 8, So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Verse 8 is talking about what is about to happen to Jesus there in Jerusalem. He is going to be taken. He is going to be killed, cast out of the vineyard. He's going to be rejected. And that's what uh, he's going to talk about in verse 10. Verse 7 actually be um, showing that, you know, that they did know that he was the son. Like he's saying, like they said, this is the heir. That's an acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they knew intellectually he was because they asked him when he was on trial, are you the son of the God? And he said, I am. And you shall see the son of, son of man sitting at the right hand of God coming of power. 
So he said that when he was on trial. So they knew that intellectually. Um, we know there's a passage that says because of envy they delivered him up. So there is that, that truth to that. It was for selfish reasons, for, for, uh, for the reasons they wanted to get rid of uh, uh, Christ. Uh, he was making them look bad. He was exposing their hypocrisy. The people were listening to Jesus. They weren't listening to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees anymore. Um, they misunderstood the concept of the kingdom and thought he would be a threat as far as a rival king and 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 uh, all of those things kind of were put into the mix as to the reasons why. I guess I just when you think about the the belief Well, that I mean that is true. Uh, John, is it John twelve? Um, forty two. John twelve and verse forty two. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So there's, there's truth to that. So there, there was a belief, but it wasn't a saving faith, of course. So uh, they're, they're rejecting him. They're, they're going to kill him. Then he says in verse 9, Therefore what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. In other words, there's going to come a judgment on that nation for rejecting Christ. And therefore, we see that in history. That's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. And the vineyard, which is the, 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 uh, the people of God, is going to be given to the others. What do you find in the book of Acts? The book of Acts, the first part of the book of Acts, they're preaching to the Jews. They have Jewish converts, Jewish converts. Then persecution breaks out. Then they're having all kinds of problems with the Jews. Paul says, because you reject the gospel, I'm turning to the Gentiles. In fact, Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, the others there, would be um, referring to others other than that Jewish nation. Of course, the kingdom from probably much, uh, pretty much the first century onward was made up of Gentiles. Um, and so that's exactly what you find there in verse 9. He says, here's what they're going to do. They're going, those who mistreated the son, the uh, man who owns the vineyard is going to come and going to utterly destroy them. Mark chapter 12 and verse 10. He says, have you not even read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Rejected. Rejected. This, you know, if anyone should have accepted him, it should have been the Jewish people, but they rejected him because John says men love darkness rather than light. And they rejected him as being unimportant. In verse 10, the stone which the builders rejected, we don't need this stone, has become the chief cornerstone, the most important stone. And this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Rejection, the rejection of Christ. Not to get into the election, but our election yesterday was a rejection of Jesus Christ for the most part. It was a rejection of his teachings in favor of socialistic thinking and, and, and sinful thinking. Reject. But here's the scary thing. You reject Christ, the nation falls. That's what you have here. That's what he's saying. You reject me, the nation falls. Verse 12, they sought to lay hands on him, 
but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. They knew exactly who this parable was spoken against when, they, when he spoke this parable. They knew exactly it was talking about him because they'd already begin, had begun earlier in the book planning on destroying him, planning on uh, getting rid of him. They questioned his authority in chapter 11. By what authority do you do these things? And he turns it around on them and asks them about the, the baptism of John. What, what authority is that? And they said, we don't know. He said, well, I won't tell you. So the, the hostility is escalating. As we see, this parable is understood by these individuals that is spoken against them. And they are definitely the targets of what Jesus is talking about. Mark chapter 12, verse 10 and 11 is, is a quote from Psalm 118, verse 22 and 23. The stones would build, uh, stone masons would build buildings and they would reject a stone. And then it turns out that that stone was the most important, the chief cornerstone in, uh, in the construction of the building. They didn't see it, they rejected it, but it, in God's building, it certainly is. Any questions or comments about that before we go any further? Right. Exactly. I mean, that, that's a good point. When people reject biblical teaching, they're rejecting Christ, and they, they reject this for another gospel. Paul talks about preaching another Jesus and people accepting that other Jesus, and it's not the Jesus of the Bible. And so people want to substitute. They want something made in their image that says their lifestyle, their behavior is okay, that approves of them, and they they don't want to uh, they don't want to uh, be challenged, and certainly don't want to be told that they're wrong. But you see, the tendency of God's people to reject all throughout history, reject. What were they doing even with Moses? What was Korah doing, challenging his authority? Challenging Moses' authority. Uh, it was Miriam, and who else that challenged Moses' authority? I forgot the other person. There was Miriam, his sister, and someone else. Aaron, Aaron and Miriam were, were against, uh, he uh, married an Ethiopian, and they, they, they challenged that. Korah challenged the authority. I mean, you go from that point on, you see... The prophets having to face people challenging the authority. And that's just, it just uh, a repeated problem throughout Israelite history. And uh, wanting rather to listen to the false prophets rather than the true prophets. You see that really chronicled in the book of Jeremiah a lot. Verses 13 through 17, you begin a section of debating where, where people are going to come up to Jesus and challenge him, and he's going to answer and turn them away, just marveling at him, just marveling at his answer. The Pharisees, they're going to, if you use a, the, a baseball analogy, they're going, to, they're going to come up to the plate. They want to strike him out. The Pharisees come up to strike Jesus out, verses 13 through 17. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. The Herodians were a, kind of a political party that was very loyal to the Herod family. The Pharisees, of course, a very prominent religious denomination within the Jewish people. And notice their motive. 
to catch him in his words. They're, they'll be trying to see if he's going to mess up. They're going to try to see if he slips up. They want to strike him out using that uh, modern-day baseball terminology. But notice what they do in verse 14. They flatter him. When they come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, but you do not, you, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? See, they're, they're flattering him. We know that you're impartial. That's what they're saying. We know you're impartial. You teach the way of God in truth. They didn't no more believe that. But they're, they're, they're flattering him. And they think they've got him. They think they've got him. Judah and the, the, the Jewish people were under Roman occupation at this time. They had to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. And they hated that. The Jewish people did. They hated tax collectors. That's why oftentimes in the, in the gospel accounts, tax collector and sinner is put together. Because tax collectors were usually, usually scoundrels. They were dishonest. They would pocket some money. They would charge extra taxes and pocket some of the money for themselves. They, I mean, they were just low characters. And they, they were very much hated by the Jewish individuals. But they wanted to get Jesus at odds with the people. So they came up with this scenario. Let's ask him if it's okay to pay taxes to Caesar or not. They really don't care whether you pay taxes to Caesar. In fact, if they had their way, they wouldn't pay any taxes to Caesar. But they want to see what Jesus is going to say. Why? Because they want to catch him in his words, verse 13. Verse 15, shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, in verse 15, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. He says, I know what you're doing. Why do you test me? I know what you're doing. He perceived their hypocrisy. He knew what was in their heart. Bring me a coin, a denarius. Verse 16, so they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. So there's a coin that's got, you know, like we have coins today, minted. And it has the image of the emperor on it. Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at at, at him. Verse 17. He answers the question in such a way that they can't trap him. They think they're going to strike him out. And he knocks it out of the park. He knocks it out of the park. They were marveled at that. The the answer is brilliant. The answer is, is logical. It's rational. He is saying there in verse 17, You render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. What What does that mean? You pay your taxes. You render the Caesar what he, he is owed to him. Romans 13 tells us where to do that, no matter who's in power. And to give us a little bit of comfort, the Caesars were a whole lot worse than our president. A whole lot worse in so many areas. And Jesus said, you render to that Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Now, what's the exception to that? They have us do something contrary to the will of God. That's what you find in Acts chapter 5 when they said, you don't preach Jesus anymore. They said, we have to obey God rather than men. That's that's the only time civil disobedience is right, correct. Other times, we're to submit. And, you know, Jesus back then and the, the people that he spoke to, they didn't get a vote. They didn't get a choice. They had to deal with what was uh, the ones ruling over them. And he says, you render the Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and you render the, to God the things that are God's. Now, what, what do we owe God? Everything. 
We owe him our love, our devotion, our, our very uh, being. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, You offer yourself up as a living sacrifice to God. Total dedication. So by answering it this way, he's saying, What, what you owe Caesar, you give to Caesar. And what you owe God, you give to God. And they marvel. He hits it out of the park. They thought they were going to strike him out. And so it's just a brilliant use of of turning the tables on them and and the use of logic. We're told, again, in, in Romans 13, that we are to obey those who are in civil government and to pay our taxes. And so we have to be uh, aware of that. Jesus never taught, never taught uh, civil disobedience. You go against the government. You be a, you form a militia and you start stockpiling weapons. He never taught that. He taught that we are to uh, we are to obey those who are in authority unless they tell us to do something contrary to the will of God. Any questions about that? Any any comments about that? Right. 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 That's what. That's exactly what they want to do. They want to discredit him. They want to make him out to be a fool. They want to catch him in his words. So they come up with these questions to try to do that, to try to trap him. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, the, these are... As far as the the religious clergy of Judea, these are the best. He's right there in the heart of their religion there in Jerusalem. And they're coming up with it uh, to try to, to trick him, to trap him. If you know the scriptures, number one, and you know how to use logic and proper reasoning, number two, every person in here could go up against a Ph.D., and, and debate with them on salvation, the church, on any issue. If you know the Bible, and you know how to use logic. It's that simple, proper reasoning. I don't have a college education. I don't have any degrees. And I've talked to PhDs who, d- who don't know the plan of salvation. And they're not as smart as their piece of paper indicates when it comes to the Bible. And it's not because I'm brilliant or anything. You know anyone in here could do it. You know the Bible. You know how to use logic and proper reasoning. You can go up against these people who think they're brilliant. Just about, about, uh, about wisdom. First Corinthians 1, verse 25. Yes, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Talking about to how the Jews... Request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. I mean, that's exactly what it's talking about there. The preaching of the cross, verse 18, to those who are perishing, that's foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So, what the world sees as foolish and, 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 and um, silly is the power of God to save them. Verses 18 through 27, okay. The, uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they couldn't do it. Now stepping up to the plate are the Sadducees. Sadducees was a religious group. They were the religious group that prominently made up the Sanhedrin. Um, the high priest order at this time was made up a lot of the, the, the Sadducees. They were the materialist. They didn't believe in, a, in afterlife. They didn't believe in angels. Uh, they were the materialist of the day. 
And they only believed in the Pentateuch. What's the Pentateuch? Book, books of law. Five, first five books of the Old Testament. That's the only portion of the Old Testament they believed in. They didn't believe in the rest of it. For I don't know all the reasons behind that, but they rejected the rest of the books of the Old Testament, only believed in the, the law of Moses, those books. And that's going to come into play in this discussion that Jesus has with them. So they don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. They don't believe in any of that stuff. So they come up with this story about this man and his wife. Verse 18 says, Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That is the Leverite law in the Old Testament. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. The second took her, and he died, nor did he leave any offspring, and the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Verse 23, And therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, uh, Whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Now keep in mind, they're asking about the resurrection there in verse 23. They don't believe in a resurrection. But they're, they're formulated this, this story of, of a woman who went through seven husbands. All seven of them died. So one died, she married again. One died, she married again. Seven of them. And they're saying... You know, if that happens in the resurrection, who's she going to be married to? And they, they think this is brilliant. For all seven had her. Verse 24, Jesus answered and said to them, you are, you, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the Scriptures nor the power of God? That's the two reasons people are mistaken today. They don't know the Scriptures. They don't know the Scriptures. And these were supposed to be those who prided themselves on being experts in the Scriptures. He says, here's your problem. You don't know the Scriptures. And if you don't know the Scriptures, you don't know the power of God. Because what, is, what does the Scriptures reveal? The power of God. You don't know what God is like, except the Scriptures tell you. So he said, here's your problem. You're mistaken. You don't know the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Very politically incorrect statement he made there. Verse 25, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now he's talking about the, the condition in the resurrection. You're neither married nor given in marriage, but you're like the angels in heaven. I believe it's Luke's account of this where he says equal to the angels. So somehow our constitution of who we're going to be in the resurrection, when we receive that glorified resurrected body, is going to be like the angels, spiritual beings. And so Jesus says marriage is not going to be carried over into the next life. It's not going to happen. You're, you neither are married nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. That's why Romans chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 says, if your spouse dies, you can remarry. You're not bound to your spouse anymore. If you're a widow or a widower, you can remarry. Because that is till death. Marriage is till death. Uh, the Mormon religion, interestingly enough, uh, they teach within their religion celestial marriage. Which means, and this might have been true with uh, Mitt Romney and his wife, that they went into the Mormon temple and before the Mormon priesthood got sealed for eternity in some sort of ceremony. So that when they die and they're resurrected at the end of time, they'll be married together somewhere in the by and by in their theology. Well, that directly contradicts what Jesus says here. They're not going to be married. Right. 
Right. Right. The spiritual. And that, that the conditions will be, will be different. It'll be a whole different realm, dimension, however you want to describe it. The new heavens, the new earth. Do I believe I will recognize Jennifer in that realm? Yes. I believe the Bible teaches recognition in the next life. But she won't be my wife. But we will be together for eternity. In joy, a joy that surpasses the marriage joy that you have here upon the earth. I mean, it'll be perfect. The best marriage you have here on earth isn't perfect. It's got problems because we're human. And we're in a, a, a realm full of, of difficulty. But in heaven, in that realm, it'll be perfect. And I believe she will know me and I'll know her and we'll know our children. Uh, Lord willing, they'll, they'll make it to heaven. And so it'll be a family, a family affair in that realm. And it'll be something uh, wonderful. There won't be any voting. There won't be any voting there. No politics there. The ruler has already been determined, and uh, he's not going away. So it's, it's talking about the, the, the beauty of the resurrection here, and, and he's saying that's not how it's going to be. You, you misunderstand. Now, here's a brilliant move. This shows the logic of Jesus here. Verse 26, But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses... In the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Twice he said you're mistaken. You don't know what you're talking about. Again, very politically incorrect. But that's how our Lord operated. They needed to hear that. You're mistaken because you don't know the Scriptures. Where does he go? He goes to the passage, the section of Scripture they believe in. They only believe in the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. Jesus doesn't go to Daniel to talk about it. There's, there's passages in Daniel that talk about the resurrection in Daniel 12. They don't believe in Daniel. He goes to the very section of Scripture that they believe in and says, Have you not read? There's another problem. Have you not read? People don't read their Bibles anymore. Have you not read? In the book of Moses, he's going to go to the place where they believe. Where Moses is at the burning bush. This is Exodus chapter 3. God is calling Moses from the burning bush. says, remove your feet. Remove your feet. Remove your shoes from off your feet. For the place whereon you stand is holy ground. And he says... I was the God of Abraham? No. I am. Present tense. At that point when God spoke to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for many, many years. Many centuries. But he says, I am. Present tense. He's using implication here. What does that imply? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive alive he's using implication god used implication to denote abraham isaac and jacob were still alive even though their their bodies were dead and decomposing but they were still alive he's showing that life does go beyond the physical body they don't believe that the sadducees don't believe that they're materialist he goes to the section of scripture they believe in and say look at what God said to Moses, and he used implication to prove it. I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's using scripture, he's using logic, he's using uh, a brilliant strategy to get across a message to them and saying, you're mistaken, 
you don't know the Scriptures. And here's what the Scripture says that Moses wrote. If you just believe in Moses, that's fine. Let's go to see what Moses said. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Knocks it out of the park. So here you have the Sadducees trying to strike out Jesus, and he knocks it out of the park. Using the Scripture, using logic and proper reasoning. The problem today with people when it comes to even those who do read the Bible is they they read it emotionally. They read it filtered through all kinds of emotions. And they don't read the Bible in a logical, rational way. And that's why they'll, you know, they'll go through a Bible reading plan. They'll read the Scriptures every day, but it, it doesn't affect them the way it should because the message is being filtered through all these emotions. And they're not reasoning through the Scriptures. How many times do you find in the book of Acts that it says Paul went into the synagogue and he reasoned with them from the Scriptures? That word reason there means he used logic. He used logic and reasoned with them from the Scriptures. We know that Jesus did that and he he taught people uh, and reasoned from the Scriptures. Jesus, after he was uh, resurrected from the dead, um, it talks about he, how he spoke to them about the, uh, the Scriptures. And um, I was trying to see if it says he used the word reason. Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to the two people on the road to Emmaus. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? It says expounded, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Expounded. Exposition of the word of God. You take it and you expound on it. Teaching. Textual teaching of the word of God. And the Sadducees, they, they failed miserably. Uh, and so their, their, uh, their attempt to trap Jesus with their scenario has failed. Beginning in verse 28, the scribes, they step up to the plate. They want to strike him out. Then one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered and said, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So he asked, what's the first commandment? And he goes to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And he says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he says, you love the Lord, your God, with all. All your intellect, all your emotion, all your mind, all your strength, your being. This is the first commandment. But he didn't stop there. He says, the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In verse 30, he's talking about the vertical relationship between you and God. And in verse 31, he's talking about the horizontal relationship between you and others. So if you got verse 30 right, verse 31 will naturally flow. And as we talked about Sunday morning, you cannot have a bad attitude and a wicked attitude towards your fellow men fellow man or your uh, your spouse in the context of Malachi or anyone deal treacherously with anyone and think you can be right with God because you have to love God supremely and then love your neighbor as yourself 
these are the great commandments. He says, there is no other commandment greater than these. Verse 32, so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love one neighbor's neighbor as yourself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So you see, this scribe said, this is a correct answer. To you love God supremely and you love your neighbor as oneself. That's what, what does it mean when he says it's more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices? What does that mean? Right. And then basically, verse 33 is a summation of what we're studying in the book of Malachi. What were they doing in the book of Malachi? They were offering, they're making these offerings, but they were substituting that for, or they were substituting the offerings for obedience, and um, they were not being obedient to God's will and dealing with one another in a treacherous way, in an ungodly way. And God says, I'm not going to accept your sacrifice. If you're going to be mean and unkind and unloving, you can't come to me and sacrifice. So when it says... Right, exactly. Right. Basically, yeah, that was their attitude. The whole burnt offerings and sacrifices were becoming a substitute for obedience. And we, we talked about this Sunday, how many people go to church and they substitute that for obedience. And they think that's sufficient. And they live how they want to during the week and think, well, I went to church Sunday. And that's not how it works. So verse 33 is dealing with what we're talking about in the book of Malachi. Verse 34 is a very interesting comment when Jesus says to him, uh, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You know, there are people who are not far from God's kingdom in the sense of they're close. They're close to being in the kingdom. They're close to being in the church. But they've never crossed over. They've never obeyed. They've never been baptized into Christ and therefore, they might have a certain morality about them, certain wisdom about them, as this man did, an understanding that you've got to love God supremely, and then you've got to love your neighbor as yourself, and that's, that's more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. He understood this. He's not far from the kingdom, but he's not in the kingdom. People who are not far from the kingdom are good moral people. They're not in the kingdom and it's like someone being in the days of noah outside the ark it doesn't matter how close you are to the ark if you're not in the ark you're going to drown in the flood you're going to drown in the flood so we have to be in the church we have to be in the body of christ not just close to it next week lord willing we will continue to study uh, mark chapter 12 and then go into chapter 13